Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Some time ago, I did a segment from our ISM Tuesdays on what about ISM, which is that uh, logical error where we seek to distract uh, away from problem X by highlighting problem Y. And it's a genuine uh, fallacy and something we need to be on our guard against. However, I want to push back a little bit and suggest that sometimes uh, what looks like whataboutism is actually uh, encouraging us to look beyond the uh, part of the iceberg that's showing and to consider the iceberg under the water or to not uh, lop the top off of dandelions. Consider, if you will, uh, two uh, compete or not competing, but two different stories that have been uh, in the news of late. One of which is the pronoun battles. Uh, we're living in a world where, for instance, <laughs> golly, Ned's, it's incredible. The ACLU wanting to praise. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the deceased former member of the Supreme Court, reprinted a quote of hers with respect to her defense of abortion. But instead of leaving it intact, they took <laughs> every reference to the female gender out of the quote and changed it. So she is speaking about her zeal for protecting the rights of persons who can get pregnant to end their pregnancy. Uh, that's the kind of nonsense this uh, pro t- or pronoun stuff is taking us to. Now, I mention that because what it really is at the end of the day is a flight from reality, which now brings us forward to uh, a more recent uh, public appearance by uh, President Biden. There were two uh, particular things that he had to say that uh, demonstrated a great distance from Reality, one of which was his complaint that trillionaires in America don't pay their fair share of taxes. Trillionaires in the in America do not pay their fair share of taxes, according to our president. Well, I'm here to rebut that claim, and even though it is my conviction that uh, determining what's fair isn't necessarily as easy as some might think. I'm quite confident that trillionaires are in fact paying their fair share, even though their fair share is zero. That's how much trillionaires pay in taxes in the United States, zero dollars and zero cents. That's the way it was in 2020 and 2019, all the way back to the very founding of this country. There has not been one penny paid in taxes by those who have accumulated a uh, net wealth of or an income of a trillion dollars. That's a very simple reason for that is that there are no trillionaires, there never have been any trillionaires, and it's virtually impossible to imagine that happening in our own lifetimes. Uh, We could have some kind of mass inflation that could bring that to pass so that we're all trillionaires, but uh, right now, the wealthiest man in America is Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, and his net worth is currently estimated at a hundred and seventy seven billion dollars. Now, that's a lot of clams. I'm perfectly willing to concede that, but it's well, well, well short of a trillion dollars. So you can just chalk it up to another misstatement, a little uh, verbal blunder by the president. It's not the first time and it certainly won't be the last time. But in this same address, there was a more uh, overt attack on reality. The reality is boys are boys, girls and girls. The reality is there are no trillionaires. But then he said this, 
I'm running, and I don't know what that's about. <laughs> I guess maybe he's planning to run again in uh, 2024. Uh, maybe he's already starting the campaign, but he said, I'm running to change the dynamic of how the economy grows, Biden said. I'm tired of trickle down. Trillionaires and billionaires are doing very, very well. Well, unfortunately, those trillionaires are once again not doing so well because they are, uh, well, at best, they are down uh, 80%, <laughs> like Jeff Bezos. Uh, but here's what I'm trying to get. Here's what he's saying. I'm running to change the dynamic of how the economy grows. Think of the chutzpah of the pride, of the arrogance, of the hubris that it takes to think that a person can change the dynamic of how the economy grows. It's like saying, well, I'm running to change the dynamic of how uh, physics work. I'm running to change the dynamic of how biochemical reactions take place. The economy grows or shrinks quite apart from our capacity to change any of its dynamics. Now, we can slow the economy, we can increase the economy, but it doesn't, none of that amounts to changing the dynamic of how it grows. Let me give you, once again, economic lesson number one. When you spend more than you create or make or earn, you will push yourself toward poverty. When you spend less than you make or earn or have, you will push yourself towards greater wealth. That's it. It's not complicated. It's profoundly simple. Why, heck, if you had enough time and enough energy and you continue to not spend more than you make, you could even end up one day maybe being a trillionaire if you, if you play your cards right. Well, again, I want you to see where we're at. I want you to see the megalomania, not just of President Biden, but of all of our presidents. These men who, who seem to think that they can change reality. But they can't. This is what insanity is. This, again, this is the same president who thinks, I want to change who gets to decide what goes in your body. I want to change the dynamics of that. It used to be you get to decide, but I'm going to change the dynamics of that so that I get to decide. It used to be that you get to decide whether to call a he a he or call a he a she. But now, I'm going to decide what you have to call them. It used to be this. It used to be that. You know, once you start talking about this kind of thing, there's no wonder that people start thinking about what is a fair share of taxes. We think we can make up our own rules, our own laws. Let me, let me illustrate this. When God established the nation of Israel, he created a system for that nation by which income was brought in for the financing of that kingdom. And in that system, there were two different kinds of taxes. There was first poll taxes. A poll tax is a tax that is exactly the same for everybody. When you cross over a toll bridge, for instance, uh, it doesn't matter whether you are a trillionaire or whether you are dirt poor. It costs the same amount to cross the bridge. That tax is not shifted or changed in any way based on your wealth or your income. That's how a poll tax works. The second kind of income that God had established was the giving of the tithe. And here there were definite differences between what one person would pay and what another person would pay. 
the poorer person would pay significantly less than the richer person, and the richer person would pay significantly more than the poorer person. But God determined that what was fair was for each person to pay 10% of their increase. This is, in modern parlance, a flat tax. There were no deductibles. There were no write-offs. And there were no graduated tax rates. See, what we have had, going back to the beginning of the income tax in the United States, and it's common in countries all across the world, is simply this. We have a system whereby not only do you pay more if you make more, in the sense that 10% of more is more than 10% of less, but you pay a higher percentage. In ancient Israel, uh, if you had a smaller uh, olive farm and your proceeds from your olive farm amounted to 100 denarii, then you would pay a tithe of 10 denarii. If you had a larger olive farm, and your uh, proceeds from your olive farm brought in uh, a thousand uh, denarii, then you would pay a hundred denarii. You made 10 times more than the other fellow, but you also paid 10 times more. With a graduated income tax, it goes something like this. Uh, if you make a thousand dollars with your small olive farm, you won't have to pay any taxes at all or some very, very small amount. If you make uh, $1,000 on your uh, olive farm, you may have to pay $100 in your tithe. If you make 10,000 uh, denarii on your olive farm, then you're gonna pay 2,000. Well, wait a minute, how is that fair? Well, the premise that what, what we think makes it fair is that when you pay the guy that, or when the guy that made a thousand pays a hundred, he's left with nine hundred. When the guy that made ten thousand pays two thousand, he's left with eight thousand. He's got so much more than the other guy. Absolutely true. But he earned more than the other guy. And when God established it again, without the graduated part, it remains just and fair and kind. This, friends, is not just policy. I mean, so often when election cycles come around and some politician is going to start promoting a flat tax and people start crunching all the numbers and saying, well, it would do this and it would do that. It would save this. It would cost that. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, we miss sight of this fact. We're talking about here what is just, what is right, what is proper. What would God have us do? Now, I'm perfectly willing to admit that God did not give us a complicated tax uh, structure to follow. But I would also say that what he did give us demonstrates that what is fair is either equal payment by all or an equal percentage payment by all. You can't fight reality. When you go against it, whether it's economic laws because that you're trying to change their dynamics or the laws of gravity, you're trying to change their dynamics, you're both in either case going to come tumbling to the ground and it will hurt. We come now in our ongoing series, the Bible in five minutes to the book of Second Timothy. And most scholars have uh, come to the agreement that Second Timothy is almost surely the last epistle written by the Apostle Paul, and that it was written from Rome, where Paul was in his uh, imprisonment awaiting his death. This puts the date somewhere uh, in the late 50s to mid-60s uh, of the first century of the church, probably more into the mid-60s would be more likely. So, Paul 
is in prison. He's in Rome, uh, which is sort of the end of the story in the book of Acts. And he writes this final letter to Timothy, his son in the faith. And of all of Paul's letter uh, that he's written, this one is certainly the most poignant and the most touching. You know, I've said before that when I get discouraged, I have a propensity to uh, take a look at the book of 1 Corinthians because I see there uh, both uh, a mess of a church, but also a church that is called uh, the beloved of, of God and the saints, etc. When I read Second Timothy, I, I get down because of Paul's rather straightforward uh, admission of his loneliness, his aloneness, that uh, many of the people that had served in ministry with him had in one way or another abandoned him. Others who remained co-laborers were just simply distant. But So you've got Paul kind of uh, at the end of his life, weary and tired, and after all that he's been through, and asking Timothy, please uh, come and visit me. Uh, essentially, before it's too late. And he asks Timothy to bring with him his books and parchments and such so that he can continue uh, in his studies. Uh, but in the midst of this acknowledgement of his own uh, weariness at the end of his life, Paul's also giving uh, to Timothy this great and powerful concluding exhortation. This is a kind of deathbed charge uh, from the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he uh, gives as that charge, the key moment or key element of that charge uh, is to remain faithful to the gospel, to remain faithful to the message, to uh, not, for instance, as Paul is probably fighting against, not to allow uh, personal suffering to uh, surprise you or diminish your zeal or your passion or your faith. That in fact, the reason that we're able to endure through these hardships, here's Paul uh, on the other side. I, I We obviously don't know for sure, but I have a sneaking suspicion that at this point in his life, he may be thinking, you know, this whole to live as Christ, to die as gain thing, I'm, I'm ready to gain. <laughs> I'm ready to uh, give up this earthly ministry so that I can be done. Uh, but in the context of that, he recognizes still that it is the gospel itself that is the ground of our God-given, spirit-driven capacity to persevere. It is the sureness of the promise of God, the sureness of the eternity that we're looking forward to because of the work of Christ for us. And the way that sort of hope gets in us and invigorates us is through God's word, preached and studied. The scriptures, we're told, they have the power to preserve us. That's where this uh, famous line, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for correction, reproof, for instruction in righteousness. Paul sort of has an ode here to the word of God as that which sustains and empowers us. So, what do we take home from this? Well, we take home the same uh, truths from it. In some ways, uh, we are the, also the descendants of Paul in the sense that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. If you are of Gentile uh, descent, then probably uh, the gospel message could get traced, that, that which you first heard could get traced all the way back to uh, Paul speaking to some Gentiles somewhere in the distant past. So that sort of makes us descendants of Paul and therefore uh, siblings of Timothy. So we should heed this counsel for it's for us too. And it is clear and it is simple. Cling to God's word. Cling to the gospel message Rest in Christ. Do not be surprised when hardship comes. Friends, this is definitely a message we need to spend time in and uh, meditate on and let it percolate in our minds because uh, 
uh, I firmly believe we're coming into a season of increasing hardship and suffering. And when we have that mentality that suffering means there's something wrong, uh, then we're doing it wrong. Let's heed the wisdom of Paul as he writes this last loving letter, not just to Timothy, but to us, to hold on to that gospel, to trust and by God's grace and power to persevere to the end. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.